Okay, so last night we got to this screen about what Darwin wrote and the fact that he wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And so today I want to finish this up so we can finish answering our questions. So let's take a look at the darwinonline.org.uk site. You will notice on this site that there's all sorts of information about Darwin and his work. We can look at his complete list of publications. We can look at his biography, media about him, about his private papers and manuscripts, and more information as well. So let's quickly take a look at his complete uh, publications. So you can see here that he has done research on finches, on geology, zoology, research on the voyage of the beagle, um, lots of journals about the geology and natural history. Continuing down here, um, some of these have been translated into different languages. He published about breeding of animals, the geology, again, world geology here, in particular, like on the structure and distribution of coral reefs and volcanic islands. He also talked about um, different testimonials from different about different scientists that were doing work at the time, the discoveries that he made in Australia, and it just keeps going and going and going. Fossil work about his origin of the species book, which has been translated into tons of different languages. Fertilization of orchids, so how this works with insects. Um, climbing plants, how different ideas are expressed, not in um, plants or animals, but in people, actually. And variation under domestication, how we've domesticated different plants and animals and how that changes them. So you name it, he pretty much wrote about it if it had to do with natural history and the world and the, the organisms that live in it. His volume of work is so extensive that you could literally take your entire life to read through all of it. So this is where you could use some of this information to answer question number eight. There's another scientist, though, that I would also like to introduce you to. His name is Alfred Russell Wallace. Now, Russell Wallace was working on evolution at the same time Darwin was. And he pretty much came up with the same um, reasons for evolution that Darwin did. He was living in what is now Indonesia. At the time, it was not called that. I don't actually remember what it was called. But he wrote to Darwin when he heard about Darwin's work, and he gave him an outline of his ideas. Darwin, you know, it says that he says, oh my gosh, this young whippersnapper is going to scoop me. He was thinking that Wallace was going to get credit for this. And he could very well have been... Pff, Hoity toity, and said, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to, I'm going to pretend I never got this. I'm never going to respond to him. I'm going to pretend it was all my idea first. But Darwin did not do that. Instead, he offered to co author a paper with Wallace, and that was published in 1858. The paper got very little public attention. People were like, eh, whatever. You know, some of the scientists read it and thought it was interesting, but for the most part, it was, eh, whatever. So Darwin decided that that was not good enough, and he needed a more robust, a more detailed explanation of what was going on. And that was when he spent the next years, not year, but a little bit more than a year, really, putting together his most famous text on the origin of species by means of natural selection. This is the book that he wrote that explains why evolution happens and how it happens to the best of his ability. The why is not so much, because the why is a uh, conclusion, really, but the how it happened, the means of natural selection, is really the important part of his book. So now let's take a look at the natural selection overview. This is where you get the answers for number nine on the sheet. Number one, observation that Darwin made about natural selection. 
Members of a population often vary greatly in their traits. If you take a look at this upper right hand corner here and this picture, these are all the same type of shell. They're the same type of a species. But, and in fact, they're all part of the same population of a species. So they all live in the same area. But there's huge variety in them. Number two, traits are inherited from parents to offspring. So the parent and offspring are going to look alike. Maybe not quite this alike all the time, but they're definitely going to look alike. And that can go for generations as well. Observation three, all species are capable of producing more offspring than their environment can support. So you look at these hundreds of baby turtles here, that environment, that island that he watched these tortoises be born on, more babies were born than there was food for. Why? Well, because of a number of environmental factors, which gets us into observation four. Because there's so many extra offspring than what the environment can allow for, the four, this brings us to the fourth natural observation overview. Owing to a lack of food and other resources, many of these offspring do not survive. The best adapted are more likely to live. So of these tortoises, for example, if they can quickly get to the water, they're going to be more likely to live than those that take a long time to get to the water because the birds can't get them. If they have a bigger, harder shell, then they may also survive more. If they're on a particular island that has the tall branches that they have to eat from, then I hope they have a long neck and then that um, saddle type shell that allows their necks to reach way up. So these are the four major observations that you should put down on question number nine. The last two are inferences. The inferences are like conclusions. They are a summary based on all of your evidence of what conclusion can you infer. It's not a 100% this is absolutely what happens every single time. It's this is what all of the evidence leads to. So the first inference is, Individuals whose inherited traits give them a higher probability of surviving and reproducing in a given environment tend to leave more offspring than other individuals. In other words, if you have a good trait, a trait that is beneficial to you, then you are more likely to survive and to have offspring yourself than an organism that does not. The second inference, this unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce will lead to the accumulation of favorable traits in the population over generations. So for example, those tortoises again, if there are some tortoises that have the saddleback shell and some tortoises that have the long necks, then those are the type of tortoises that are more likely to survive and therefore they are going to mate and their offspring are going to have the saddleback shell and the long necks combined. Similarly with the finches, all the finches came to the islands as one type of finch, but when they got there, some finches had the variety of having large beaks so they could eat the larger nuts. Some finches had the variety of having longer, thinner beaks so they could get more of the nectar things out of the buds. So it all depends on what the variety was within a population and then of that variety, some traits will be more successful in surviving and in uh, being growing old enough to reproduce than others. That is the summary of natural selection. Hopefully with this background information, you'll have a better idea of what you're looking at with Darwin's notes and understand the assignments that we're doing this week. We are going to have a short quiz on natural selection next week, but I will tell you more about that and post an announcement about that as well. So bye for now.